Okay, so um, making your own slot, you know, the principles. So our group had this project. I mean, nobody builds anything, and in a Aries group, if you don't know how to build stuff, that means you don't know how to fix stuff either. So when the radio breaks, and you're the only one in the facility, they're just screwed. So I wanted my folks to learn how to build. So we tried to build a very simple digital interface circuit so they could do WinLink or something else, and. One guy brought a 100-watt Weller soldering gun. <laughs> that was my first clue that this group didn't know much. It took us 16 hours to build that kit. Two Saturdays. I couldn't believe they put up with it. Um, and after that, I learned, because I, I'd never seen anybody move so slow. They didn't know what a resistor was. They didn't know what a capacitor was. They had no clue how to connect them, how do you make a solder joint. Do I just keep heating this transistor until that blob pl of plastic melts? I mean, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's pretty sad. I transistors when I was a kid soldering that didn't quite know what I was doing. It was pretty sad. Um, so we discovered that if we went to a printed circuit board, we could have our crew build things and it cut the time to a quarter. And uh, I had an expert guy with me, and we, we discovered he cut us in a quarter, too. So what we could do in, in, you know, we were cut by the same percentage as the beginners. It's just they went from three hours, and we started at 45 minutes and ended up at 15 minutes or something. But you can have ground planes, which is great, because now you have a lot less RFI interference to your circuit. Microstrips are even possible if you're doing VHF, UHF work. Um, high capacity wiring is possible, so you can actually handle some amps if you need to. Um, it means that your builders no longer have to worry with making the connections, and they just have to worry with the parts. So it takes some of the worry off. It also generally provides the support that the components need to solve their holes in place. And you can even mix and merge um, through hole and surface mount. And I'm going to tell you a lot about that. Okay. These are the kind of people I work with. You'll notice we aren't spring chickens. Um, so it's an anti-Alzheimer's activity for us. We teach. It's way cheaper. We uh, have a lot of fun working together. That's my kitchen table. We cover it with um, cardboard and we go to work. And we've been doing this for several years. So here's an example. Well, one of the things that we built, now I've learned that I have this. <laughs> so, um, does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it didn't work on this. I went and worked on that. <laughs> That's interesting. So it's got a series P channel MOSFET, and if that voltage is negative, it simply shuts off. Nothing burns, nothing gets bothered. But we had one guy who had destroyed two radios. It's not the power poles we've been in trouble. It's the clips on the battery. If it's underneath the workshop and you're too lazy to get a flashlight, you guess wrong. And it used to be on that side. <laughs> the light turned the battery around. <laughs> so at any rate, um, that's a polarity protector. And that's my circuit board. Um, so you can build sound card systems. We build signal link equivalents for like 30 bucks. Polarity protectors, uh, common mode current meters, QRP, tiny receivers, transceivers, solid state linear amps, bench power supplies, lightning arresters, school receiver. Enclosures are usually the most expensive part for us and hardest to build. You can buy metal tin boxes that are really cheap. And if it'll fit in that, they're cheaper than aluminum because aluminum is expensive. Um, stuff from Home Depot is really cheap. So if you can fit it into something an electrician uses, that stuff's made in high volume, and so they're uh, generally cheap. Um, you can even build things in surplus radio boxes. And as you can see, one of my prime places to shop for cabinets is the thrift store because they sell all kinds of pots and pans and tins from Christmas and all kinds of stuff that's in interesting shapes 
and if you can build your radio in it, you're done. So this was a receiver that we built for, a, I had six graders soldering this together, but nobody had ever let them solder before. They were just, they were in hot cover. They had no idea what they were doing, and they heard a great point of doing it. So um, this is an Asher Farhan design that I stole, and it's real simple. You put four diodes here, and what does that make? It's a demodulator. <laughs> this Arduino is an SI5351 that goes here, generates the frequency, goes into that thing, RF comes in here, and out comes audio. It's a single side band, it's a double side band detector. And then this is a simple audio amplifier, and then it's an LM3 6 chip for a speaker amplifier. Um, these are the things where you put the to dial the frequency in and push it up and down. The display is on the other side and it reads out your frequency to the hertz. It's really cool, $60 receiver. It's not a single sideband receiver because there's no crystal filter. But they had great fun and I put a microphone on it. So when we first build it, we connect the microphone through a jumper to the, this amplifier and it becomes a tiny PA. And then later, we connect it to the input of this amplifier, and it's a much better public address system. So they, they get to see it actually work. And then <coughs> my sixth graders wound the toroids from the input and output trans, uh, transformers to the balanced modulator. And the only kids in my city, I'm sure, ever wound the toroids. You know? So I'm reform, all kind of stuff. Dirt cheap. So here's your print circuit board. So those boards cost me maybe six or seven dollars each. I don't know. Uh, the polarity protector uh, circuit. Um, we built 11 of these to go on the go boxes at our county because I was terrified that my group would destroy the $5,000 radio. And luckily we have never destroyed one um, as a result. And I have them on every expensive radio that I've got. A 7300. And it's a real simple circuit. They only lose like 0 0.01 volts. You can barely measure it. It's less than what you lose across a fuse. Um, so that's another circuit we built. Um, there's the, the circuit board to the polarity protector um, and the parts for the polarity protector. We made up little kits and our group gets together to build them. So there is this company in America, www.expresspcb. And they rope you into their stuff. They've got nice software, but it will only write to their process. And their boards are terribly expensive. And they will not let you get the Gerber files, the universal language of printed circuit boards. If you, if you get stuck with this company like I did, it will take you a year or two to realize how you're being screwed. And then eventually, you will learn how to use a good company and then you will start using Gerber producing software and you will get your boards. Typically, the, the cost for me to get a set of boards is about $25 to get five boards, maybe 10. If it's your first time, you'll get 10 boards for $25. It's $5 to build them and $20 to ship them. Now, if you make your order on Monday, not the next Monday, but the next Tuesday, it will be on your doorstep. It's amazing. Seven days and you have your boards. So I don't even bother to do a prototype anymore. Is that from China? Yeah, from China. Yeah. So when it's Monday here, it's Tuesday there already. Or <coughs> so I, I don't bother to do, you know, breadboard anymore. I draw the darn thing. I have the boards made. I put one together. If it doesn't work, I redraw it and get the final product. <coughs> it's so fast. 
they have a way to share projects. <coughs> so some of my projects have been shared. So you can go get them, and you can just take the Gerber and say, I want that. They will even assemble stuff. You'll pay through the nose, but they will assemble it. So one of the things we wanted for field day was a bandcast filter. So we could run 75 meters and 80 meters at the same time, or we could run 80 and 40 right next to each other. So I, I, I'm not doing that great board. So I made the printed circuit board, and we got bandcast filters. And then when I built them, toroids and mica, silver mica capacitors took forever to tune them. Oh, then we put them inside paint cans. Paint cans are cheap at Home Depot and work nicely shielded. And the good thing at the top is you can put the SO239s through. And we got these great cans. Look like duplexer cans. Yeah. But they're uh, 80, 40, 20, whatever. So that's easy to do. <coughs> so this is a company, PCBWay.com. And you have to answer some stupid questions. Whenever you don't know the answer, just leave the default, and you'll get a pretty decent set of boards. I only do two-layer boards. I don't do fancy stuff, so I have a top layer and I have a bottom layer. And my bottom layer is usually my shield, so the board is kind of self-shielding. Um, and I just have all kinds of fun. So this is another board that I did. This was, this was a kind of a wild board. Um, I, it was intended for multiple purposes. It's a smart battery charger, recycler, tester, you name it, for batteries. So I can do any kind of battery, lithium, whatever. But I also left the gizmo on it that can control the SI5251. So I can use this as a variable VFO if I need it to. So I can make it be a VFO or a battery charger or whatever I need. That's a dual purpose. All it is is solder pads, right? What you do with them is up to you when you get them back. So. Um, this is one of my sound card systems that never got completely finished. But this is basically a signal link, only it's a quarter of the price of a signal link. Um, and so we've done dozens of those. We don't, I typically don't bother buying a signal link unless I need it for a real hardened application. So the purpose of this talk is to get you started. So, uh, Oh, I forgot. It says here that the boards are at my house six days after the order. I thought it was eight, but I guess it's six. At any rate. <clears throat> Does that price include the solder mask and the uh, stencil? Or the oh, yeah. Not the stencil. Because if you want the stencil, it's 15 bucks extra. If you're going to do printed circuit board. But uh, if you're going to do uh, surface mount. But you don't need the stencil if you're doing through holes. But it's everything that you see on those boards. Um, the, okay. the screen printing. The, it's solder resist, everything. They're just really nice boards. Okay, so you're yeah. yeah, what what's a stencil? What why would I want? Ah, wait, I'm gonna tell you. It has okay. to do with surface wait, mount. Okay. Yeah. It has to do with, with uh, surface mounts. So the company that I use is diptrace.com. They have a free version of their software and it's gonna take you a couple hours. Okay? But download their free version. If you want, they have some excellent training materials. I'm a pain in the butt, so I never took their training until I got lost, and then I would go back. Now, Osher does not use dip trace. He uses KiCad. A lot of people use KiCad. It's also free. And I picked dip trace, and so maybe I'll learn KiCad also, because I've already learned two of these programs, so maybe I'll learn a third. OK. <coughs> so. There is an auto layout. If you enter the schematic into the software, they will lay the board out for you. But I usually want to lay it out myself. I want to know where the wires go. And I'm lazy, and I never learned how to use the schematic part too good. So I just lay the boards out myself. It just takes like an hour, and I'm done with the board, and it, you know, it goes for forever. Um, they also have the ability to do these copper pores. And that's how you get the bottom shielding. Once I learned how to do that, oh, oh, so much better. Because you've got like a pass and it's to ground from every single lead if you wanted it. Um, so here, here's the first deal. You bring the software up and the first thing you do is that little button right there that I've got circled and that is how you make the outline of the board. So you go click, 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 click. I want the outline right here. 
And it's going to, at first, you're not going to understand the magnification, so you may want to actually get the ruler out and look at it and eventually, but you'll see how to do that. Once you've got the board drawn, see that nice purple board that I've got there? Now you've got to pick a compart uh, where you want to put stuff. So you have the choice of, do I want to work on the top or the bottom of the board? <coughs> so components go on the top, the ground planes go on the bottom, traces can go on either top or bottom, but you always got to remember which side of the board am I working on. So components, they have a bunch of different called libraries. So the discrete library includes capacitors, resistors, it's a transistor library, diodes. They're all kind of libraries and every company's got their library that they want to sell you because the library has the, the, the picture of the pads that are needed for their device. And if they can lock you into their device, then you have to buy their semiconductor from now on. But most of the stuff that I need is dirt cheap simple. So I can use any resistor, it doesn't matter, they're all the same, right? It's either two pads or two holes. So you, you don't have to spend forever. So here I have put some components on the top side. And now let me see if I can find the program and we'll just do it. <coughs> I don't remember exactly where I put it. It's been like a year since I actually did any of this, but we'll find it. So here's dip trace. And I don't want, I want, I don't want the schematic gizmo, I don't want the tutorial, I want the printed circuit board layout. So we're going to go there. So up comes my dip trace, which is out of date. They probably have a better one by now, but, you know, it's good enough, right? So if it will ever load, no, I don't want the guided tour, no, I don't want all this stuff. Where was that button that I said to use? Right there. Was that it? No. Nope. That one. That one. Thank you, guys. All right, now we got a board. Okay, we're working on the top side. I don't know what that top assembly is. Um, I'm going to do top silk. Okay, so now I'm in silk screen, and I'm going to do an object and I'm going to do a text. And here's my text. Somewhere in there, there's a thing to set how big it I don't know where it is. I don't care. OK, so now I type something that's going to show up on my board. When I get it back from China, it will have either yellow or white print. This is an example. Everybody get that? All right, now, we're going to find an object. We're going to place a component. I have no idea, but let's pick something. Uh, they have a lot of things. Um, let me see if we can find anything else. Component patterns. Uh, components is pretty good. I don't want that. Can I find? Uh, Oh, there, transistors NPN. Let me try that one. Oh, hey, I recognize something. Woo! -hoo! I found, I found a transistor. I'll put a lot of. Okay, objects, place component. Uh, what else have they got? Have they got resistors? Where are resistors? Oh, oh, resistors. Oh, that kind. Man, they got a lot of resistors. So axial is through holes. I must have picked a big resistor. Okay, now objects, place component. Um, let me find resistors chip. I think I learned the kind that I want. No, I don't want metric, I want inch. I think I want a 1206. Because I, I can actually solder a 1206. <laughs> I can do that. It's not easy, but I can do it. All right, so I have some resistors. Now I want some capacitors. Are there any capacitors? Man, there's a lot of capacitors. A lot of weird things here. There's
There's some chip capacitors. Somebody's after me. I want a 1206 large. All right, here's a capacitor. And let me see who's paging me. Oh, it's one of our ham guys. Okay, I can deal with him. Objects. I want to see if there's anything better. You can also do fine component. And you can, they have this library, Snap EDA, and I found stuff there that I didn't know where to find. So there's, there's ways to hunt for things in there. So you can try that also. You just have to find one of each of the gizmos that you like. And then they've, it doesn't have to go with a component. As long as you can get the thing that you want, like uh, if you've got a connector that has certain kind of things, like that might be an RCA phono plug. Once you find it, you can just use it. So oh, look at that, diodes, diodes. So here's things for diodes. So I'll put in a couple of diodes, okay? So now we got some components on our board, right? We got some huge resistors. We got some regular old things. So now um, I think I'm working on the top side. I hope I hope that's going to work. If it doesn't, we'll fix it. Okay. Now I'm going to try to route some stuff, and one of these buttons is a route button, route manual. Okay, and I'm going to route on the bottom side. So I'm going to go to the bottom side. At least I think I. Can. <clears throat> I'm going to try anyway. And I just put my, looks like I put it in on the top, but who cares? Uh, I just put a link. Oh, that's what I'm looking for. It's that word right there. That's the one I'm looking for. Now I'm going to put stuff on the bottom. So let's see, where was my button again? This button here. Okay, so let's see. Dink. To dig. The green means it's on the bottom, and the red means it's on the top. And I'm just wiring up a storm here, folks. Oh, it can't connect because because that thing's on the top, so I can't go there. Uh, I'll I'll find another way. Oops, I didn't get it. Okay, I got that. Now let's go back to the top. Uh, how can I do this? Because the through holes have both a top and a bottom to them. So through hole stuff, I can connect, because that's a through hole resistor. It's got a top and a bottom. Make sense? Yeah. But you can add those things. This little gizmo right here will add a via, a hole through, and they will plate the via for you in China. So you can like, I, I think this will work. I can add a V, well, it was a little bit off center, but I can add a via, and now I've got a hole that goes through the board. And back in the past, I knew how to put holes on this board. Ah, mounting hole, mounting hole. Punch, that's not very big. Properties, hole. There's a way to make that bigger, but I don't remember. I can change my view. I can go to, I like working at 200%. So I can see with my ancient eyeballs. So are you getting an idea of how I lay out all these connections? Everybody see that? Let's see, am I on top or bottom? I'm on top. So let's do a, a few more while I'm, uh, I gotta be back in the route thing, route. Okay, let's see that. Can go that. This can go there. This can go there. Back to bottom, bottom, and I'll go from here to there. Oops, I didn't make it. Punch. And I think I can keep going. Oh, how do I get? I don't understand. It did part of that on the top, and I'm not sure, really quite sure why. Okay, it says I can merge these two nets, so I just merged them. It detected I connected some things. Okay, so you've watched me. Now, there are ways to tell this. How thick I want the line to be. Let me see if I can find it.
Okay, I just made that one thick, so that, that just got way thicker, okay, if I want to handle more, more power or something. Now, one of these buttons, uh, one of these buttons will let me put in a copper pour. Let me go back to the talk, because I know I, I explained how to do it in the talk. So let me, let me go back to the talk. Okay, so we did some manual bottom routing, manual top routing, red instead of green, silk screen, I typed some stuff, I think it disappeared, but, but you can put it back. Copper pour, ah, here's where I gotta do the copper pour. So we're, oh, it's that funny looking thing. Okay, so let's go back and find the copper pour, because this is really cool. Yeah, really. <laughs> so we're gonna, I wanna be on the bottom, I don't know why it says bottom too. Oh, it just means it's the second side. Okay, so now we're going to do a copper pour. Oh, come on, Gibby. Okay, now my copper pour is going to be solid. I can make it be in, I can have it be gridded if I want. Um, and then uh, yeah, 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 line width, line spacing, connectivity, borders, pour priority, current state poured. We'll make it be unpoured. And I'm going to have clearance be uh, one millimeter. Okay, now my copper pour exists. I didn't mean to do that. But it's not poured. Okay? So you can see what it looks like when it's not poured. And now I'm going to turn it to poured. Bank. Isn't that wild? I just got a copper pour, <coughs> and it's also probably specking out some little boo-boos that I've done or showing me the top or whatever. But I now have an RF shield, and I can connect that to some of the nets. So if I pick a net, a net is a collection of points, that is going to be my ground, and I tell it connect to net 5, then all of a sudden my copper pour becomes part of ground, and every time I add something that connects to net 5, it automatically connects to the copper pour also, and will reconnect every time I re-pour the copper. So now I have an automated entry, and here's, here's a top view, so now you can see the components, and you can see the stuff that is connected on the top, but not connected on the bottom, right? So you're seeing both traces at once, the green's on the bottom, it's copper on the bottom, this is a copper trace, this is a copper pour, and you can see here's a top trace that's in red, and it doesn't care about what's on the bottom of the pour. I asked for pretty wide spacing on everything, so I got huge spacing. You can also set it so that uh, when you have a ground point, you can make it be solid, but they're very hard to solve it. Or you can make it be connected with just a couple of lines, which makes it easier to solve it. So that's a little, little slicker once you learn how to do that. It's just point click, right, right click, set the properties. Tell them you want it to look like that. You bingo it, doesn't it? Questions on this so far? So in, in 20 minutes, you will have your first layout. It will be the wrong size. And yeah, you connected up the wrong stuff. But you, you, you'll be playing with it and like, why did I ever bother with a breadboard before? You know, so already we're doing some pretty cool stuff. Okay, so now let me find where I am. Does the software do any analysis? <coughs> Sir? Does the software do any analysis? Of what? Um, like ground loops or no. current carrying capacity? Is no. Fine? Nope. That's up to you. Okay. All of that is up to you. Thanks for asking. Are these two ounce boards? Sir? Are these two ounce boards? You can make them, you can have it any way you want. You can pay as much money as you want, and they'll make it any way you want. I always go with a, uh, whatever the base price is, which I think is, I can't remember if it's one or two. But whatever the, the default is, I always take it. Except there was this one thing I went for a thicker copper on, and they did it. Okay, so we did that. <coughs> so I showed you how we could avoid traces. Um, Copper pour properties, 
So there I'm picking that I want a four, four spoke thermal. And now you can see the four spoke thermal on that one right there. So instead of being solid to ground, it's got four spokes to it, so it'll be easier to solder. Uh, you can see it on this one also. Back to the top view, you can see I've got a transistor there, I've got a diode, uh, I've got another huge resistor, and then the really cool part is check the design rules. I didn't know how to do this, the first three or four or five boards I did. And finally, they kept telling me I had to design them. Like, what? And I learned that it's got a button for checking design rules, and it will tell you if there's anything too close to be manufactured. So you don't need to bother FTPing it or emailing it to China. You just check the design rules. They do exactly the same thing at their end. And if it fails the design rules, you get a little note back, failed design rules, problem here, here, here. But this does it for you. So now here comes the tricky part. You have to export this to Gerber. And unfortunately, you have to choose between dip trace ASCII, DXF, Gerber, Gerber times two, NC drill, ODB2. Do you see that it can export a lot of different ways? <coughs> so I want everybody to tell me, what is the way we want to export? Gerber. Gerber, there you go. We're going to export to Gerber. And if it offers you a choice, you're going to tell it, I want every dead gun one of them. OK? <coughs> and then you also want drill symbols. I don't know what that is, but they want it. <laughs> so tell them, yes, give me that too. OK? And then you learn how to use Windows to zip the whole dead gum thing up. So there's this thing where you highlight it all, and then you right click, and you say send to zipped folder and it turns it all into a zipped folder for you. There's the right click, the send to, compress zip folder, and then you will have your little zip of all your files. You need to know the size of the board, so measure it in millimeters or inches. You know, my, because your program will tell you what your board size is. It'll tell you how many connections you got. Dip trace will allow you to have 300 connections. I've only had, had problems with that once. Once I created a board with just over 300 connections and I simplified it a bit, it was fine. Upload your zip file on their web page. It couldn't be simpler. It takes them, depending on whether or not it's a day or night or holiday in China, you will have answers back in an hour to a day or two. But usually it's a few hours and the answer's back, all right, it's time for you to pay. And once you pay, then they start billing it. Never give them a credit card number. Only use PayPal. Never ever give them a credit card number. I wouldn't trust them. So I use PayPal as an in-between. I've had a ton of successful projects, and I write my manuals with Kindle Direct Publishing. I've published manuals. This is our sound card interface. We built a zillion of this thing so we didn't have to buy signal links. Um, I've used every metal box that every electrician ever thought of as an enclosure. I built the harmonic relay board to fix Osher's version 3 of his micro bit X. It had crappy problems. Um, I want you to know what this little part is right here. <coughs> I, I, I didn't know much about SCT solder. So you see that little board right there? That is an SI5251. $9 we added for it. All solder. And it's got these little tabs, and it's got pins that you can solder to it. It's got these tabs that you can put a SMA connector on, or you can just solder a wire to it. Three oscillators at your beck and call that will go all the way to 160 megahertz. And the uh, base of the thing is a, I don't know where it is. There's a crystal, I think it's that. <coughs> um, there's a crystal on it. It's not great, but it is a crystal. And so you've got a crystal controlled oscillator that you can have any, within a hertz or two of what you want, anywhere you want. Three up. Now there is some crosstalk, but it's down in the negative 60 dB range. So with a little bit of thought, you can avoid problems with that. So I use that chip, that board, breakout board, a lot of times. So I didn't have to buy and solder the SI 5251. It's now being replaced by a, a clone in China, the MM. 5251 because the American part is tough to find right now. That is a really cool thing. I built VFOs. That was what I was using over there for uh, single side generated seed kits. 
just feed it. It's three volts. Three volts peak to peak, so it's about one volt RMS. And if you need more, just amplify it with the 2N3904, or even run it into a 6AU6 or a 12AX7 and amplify it. Okay, uh, this was kind of a crazy project, but it would it was designed to become an electronic keyer, and I never actually got completely finished with it. Um, through all components are disappearing. They're getting harder and harder to find. So I finally learned <coughs> I had to to fill with this stupid S Bidex that for ten bucks you get this diaper pin full of resistors that are SMDs. They're all quarter watt resistors, and there's just everything you can think of, like ten of each of them. And you take a pair of tweezers and you just pull off until you get one, and you drop it on your desk and it falls on the floor and you get another. <laughs> And you you uh, you get a nice pair of tweezers, and I had this itty bitty soldering iron from my brother gave it to me, my left wing brother, uh, and it reads out what temperature the iron is at. And 380 is the maximum. You want to use the old kind of solder that doesn't need to be nearly as hot, lead tin solder. And you can solder these things. They're, they're not, they're, they're tiny. I'll give you, they're tiny. But it can be done. And you I use two. Hmm? You don't use two solder irons? <coughs> I just use one. If you do two, both paths at the same time, you will <coughs> You're smarter than me. It will float and the surface tension will bring a right perfect line. Oh, you're so smart. <laughs> you're so smart. Sure. Okay, so now let me show you capacitors. I remember that. Ah! There went 10 cents of capacitors. <laughs> so these are capacitors. And what I haven't figured out is some of them, they've got to be electrolytic. They're all, this is 4.7 microfarads. And I don't know which side's positive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I've read that they're actually ceramic. That they're not electrolytic. So I don't really know what's going on here, but I have them all the way from 10 picofarads to 22 microfarads, and I paid like eight bucks or nine bucks. I couldn't believe it. So you know, when my allowance comes in next week, and we'll buy some more of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got all I've got like an entire library of components now, and I'm going to buy some transistors too. You know, <laughs> this is wild what I can do now. <laughs> so here are the chip capacitors, and I, I have the links here that you can just go buy them. Well, you just buy a whole package from Amazon for 10 bucks. And since I got Prime, you know, I'm done. <coughs> okay, and then you want to buy this stuff. <coughs> chip quick. I'm not sure if I brought it. So this is a paste, and the dude back there probably knows what it is, right? Uh, no, this is actually after my time. Huh? This is after my time. Yeah. So I've got quick. some in a, in a syringe that I use. Yes. In the Chip refrigerator. Quick. In the, my refrigerator, yes, I do. <laughs> this is solder paste. It's got solder in it, but yep. it's like Vaseline. And you just put it where you want to solder the thing, and then hit it, and all of a sudden solder appears. The resin goes off, and it's solder. And it melts at a low temperature because it's just lead tin. This is not just yeah, you buy it. Yeah, you can buy it. So I'm going to buy more of it. But I tried this stuff, and it actually works. And this is the coolest thing. So then, <coughs> the guys on the S Bidex thingamajigger told me I needed to buy this thing. I'm like, well, this is wild. What is this? So it's a hot air rework tool. And I've actually tried this, and it actually works. And I haven't done much with it yet. But I, I had some old computers, and I tried to take parts off of them. Those were not put on with ChipQuick. <laughs> <laughs> I put ChipQuick on, and the ChipQuick, I could melt it real easy. But their stuff, I couldn't melt at all. Uh, so you pick what temperature you want. And it, I put the smallest tip, it comes with multiple tips. It, it's a hair dryer. It pulls in from here. It's got a heating element up here. It comes with a spare heating element. 
and it's got a temperature sensor in it that looks like a piece of, of uh, thermistor wire, and you just set what temperature you want, and it goes there. You want 277 centering? I don't know how accurate this is at all. I have no idea. And then it's got a fan thing, so I can have more or less, and it's like microprocessor controlled, and it will readjust the heating to where it stays in the right temperature. And I can make it show it to me in Fahrenheit or in centigrade. And they tell me that this is the way to do rework on a system. And I've done it all with a soldering iron so far, but um, I will, I just got this like three days ago. And I will be doing more and more with this thing, and less and less with the soldering iron. I bet you it's falling out. Yeah. Um, because it, 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 this is hard work for the soldering iron. And um, I, I would like to have less hard work. What kind of price range is that? $80. Okay. And it came with, it came with a whole bunch of itty bitty tweezers okay. and replacement parts. And I'm like, wow, this is a bad question. Can you use that for soldering too? Yeah, if you make a station that has both the soldering iron and that. It's so. hot. Apparently you can heat shrink with it. It's got bigger tips too if you want. Wait until it cools off before you try to change the tip. <laughs> <coughs> okay, oh, I didn't tell you the stencils. I didn't tell you the stencils. So the stencils, I don't think so. It started at 1.30, right? It's almost 2.30. The stencils are a stainless steel thing with holes cut everywhere there's a hand. And you simply put the stencil on top of the board and then lay out some chip, chip quick and use a credit card as a squeegee and go down the board with it and then pull the stencil off and the stuff is only where the pass is. And it acts like glue, so lay the parts down on top of it and if you pull it out, when they melt, they'll sit it all the way. <clears throat> you know, once you've laid all the parts and you put it in the oven, it's fine. You put back out and it's all done. Where do you get the stencils for PCB way will make you the stencil for your design also. You only need one stencil and you stand yeah. so you keep reusing it. 15 bucks. It'll save you all kinds of time. You ever use an engineering oration?